Well, thank you all and welcome back uh, for the concluding uh, discussion of this very uh, informational uh, meeting this morning and noontime. Um, we are going to uh, build on uh, the very rich uh, discussions in the two panels this morning about the economic and foreign policy implications of the relationship uh, with the U.S. and Japan and perhaps explore some of the other regional aspects of that. Uh, important developing relationship. With me today uh, on the far end is Yoichi Funabashi, the chairman and spearhead of the Rebuild Japan Initiative Foundation that is collaborating in this program today. Uh, he is also the former editor-in-chief of Asahi Shimbun in Japan, which many of you recognize as uh, I'll say it, uh, occupying an equivalent position to the New York Times in terms of size and its position within the overall debate in Japan over the years. Uh, Dr. Richard Haas, the President of uh, Council on Foreign Relations, who probably needs no introduction to this group or just about any other group. Go ahead, though. But, but <laughs> <laughs> Long history of uh, <laughs> <laughs> academic, intellectual, and governmental service, and 40 years of, uh, of visits and engagement with Japan. Uh, and with Yuichi personally. And, and with Yuichi personally. Let me, um, let me start this today, uh, uh, Funabashi-san, with the, uh, a question which may uh, allow you to uh, speak briefly as to the um, intents and desires of the Rebuild Initiative the Japan Initiative, but let me do it in a bit of a challenge. It seems to me that uh, there's another Japan uh, that is, uh, much as we as internationalists might wish to have a robust Japan on the global stage, both economically and otherwise, there is another Japan, which, the size of which I can't tell you, but it is substantial, that is not so discontent with the way things have gone over the last generation. That is to say, in an aging, affluent society, at peace in the world, uh, generally able to enjoy the fruits of uh, the great Japanese uh, rebound of the post-war years, and not so interested, perhaps more insular or internally focused, not so interested in the sort of Abe experiment in sort of re-engaging and re-establishing Japan's presence in the world. I wonder in that respect, do you and your associates see uh, any risk of getting essentially out ahead of your countrymen in what you're trying to accomplish with, uh, with your initiative? Tim, thank you uh, <coughs> for your question. Um, I think uh, what we are witnessing, the Japanese political dynamics and social dynami dynamics, very much differently now being framed uh, from the one we have known in the past 70 years. Uh, for instance, just to take an example of Okinawa. Uh, Shira actually is an authority in Okinawa, uh, you know, than uh, anybody else, better than anybody else. Um, the debate line has not been framed uh, either right or wrong, uh, uh, left any longer. Um, even the most conservative LDB uh, politicians in Okinawa now have argued uh, that the Futema uh, uh, air station now be uh, transferred beyond Okinawa. Okay? And that's against the government policy. LDP government policy, um, that identity poli politics has really now set in. Us Okinawans versus mainland Japan, us versus them. It's very, very now strong. Okay. So um, this is just my microscopic Okinawa case. But overall in Japan, I think that identity poli politics has actually really emerged, particularly since early this century. Uh, perhaps since the advent of Koizumi administration. Uh, before Koizumi administration, Japanese politics actually has been more moderate 
conservative uh, politics. But since then, it has been cha changing. And one of the reasons is, uh, I think, that demographics uh, and the Japanese uh, fiscal situation, worsening fiscal situation, that uh, politicians have not been uh, able to resort to fiscal measures uh, as a lubricant to uh, placate that disgruntled, dissatisfied uh, franchise. Okay? Uh, so they have looked to identity symbols and the others. And nationalism actually has been the most, uh, I think, that experience, uh, experience and convenient too uh, for some of the, those people. Okay? And then the rise of China actually has really contributed to uh, uh, that, uh, this uh, uh, strengthening this identity politics too. So um, I think that this is fundamental uh, uh, long-term uh, uh, change, uh, tectonic change we are now witnessing in Japan. So Abenomics and Abe politics should be seen as a part of this. But nonetheless, having said that, I think that Prime Minister Abe also uh, has uh, uh, been compelled to uh, uh, get back Japan. That means uh, that get over. Uh, the uh, end of the uh, deflation, okay? And in order to uh, strengthen the balance of power vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, you have to create the power first before uh, strengthening the balance of power. That means that wealth, okay? So this Abenomics is pro-growth strategy. Uh, and that's actually been, has been working to some extent as we listen uh, this morning's session. So, um, I think that uh, he, even though he went to Yasukuni Shrine once, as the <coughs> Professor Shirai said, I don't think he will visit any longer because he already, I think, uh, satisfied his constituencies. But basically, I think he believes in real politics. And this is a very, very unique Japanese politician who really does not uh, uh, hesitate to uh, uh, appeal to the public that geopolitics is important. Japan's power matters. Okay? And the US-Japan alliance matters most. Okay? And a very, very visible, very, very, I think, uh, strong uh, message. So I think that over the past two years or so, I think that we have had this uh, a TPP conclusion and uh, President Obama's clear uh, uh, pledge to defend Japan based on obligation uh, uh, to defend uh, on uh, the uh, uh, Article 5. And then uh, I think that uh, the UN, United States uh, sending that uh, vessels uh, through, uh, sailing through within that 12 nautical miles, which Japan has requested repeatedly uh, to the United States to, to conduct. So I think that overall, that relationship between Japan and the United States have been very much stabilized, very, very, very. Japan it has feel very much assured. Perhaps except for Jap you know, the United States presidential election campaign, that's really has yeah. really well concerned a lot. The particularly Japanese, you know, conservatives who have been uh, traditionally very friendly to Republicans. Okay, so I think that uh, my uh, the directly responding to your inquiry, I think. Uh, Yes, we are seeing this very much so, sort of different kind of political dynamics, much more right wing, much more identity politics based. But at the same time, I think that with the real politic and uh, I think uh, uh, politics also is emerging as a new dynamics. I, I want to get Richard's view on this as well, but just to follow on that point, because Prime Minister Abe is seen at least here and in much of the world as so representative of this uh, quest for a robust Japan. His return to power was in the face of an imploded opposition. Uh, effectively, he, uh, he had no uh, real material opposition in that campaign. We're only seeing some of the resistance in the fight over Article 9 and such and the attempt to reestablish the Japanese military presence. Is the quest for a robust Japan properly identified with Prime Minister Abe, or is this, uh, are we perhaps, or at least I, uh, personifying it in too narrow of a, of a way? I think Abe's personality and Abe's uh, uh, 
sort of, uh, you know, uh, ch challenge politics. That means comeback kid, you know, uh, really uh, resonates uh, to the public uh, who have felt that Japan is being lost, has been lost. And uh, we really feel compelled to get something back. Uh, and uh, we, we, we need some strong leadership uh, to stand tall vis-a-vis uh, -vis China's aggressiveness and China's challenge. So uh, I think his personality really fits and sits well with the Japanese, Japanese psyche uh, at this moment. So even if we would not have a Prime Minister Abe, I think somebody uh, like Abe, I, I think will emerge and should emerge perhaps uh, in, the, in the future. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Richard Haas, you have written in the American context about uh, foreign policy reach extending beyond grasp uh, in terms of uh, some powerful forces in the American uh, government perhaps uh, getting ahead of their countrymen. Do you see any parallel in, in the current Japanese experience? Parallel in terms of what the U.S. is doing in Asia? Or what no, Japan in terms of uh, some elements, okay. powerful elements <clears throat> exceeding what their countrymen really are prepared to, the burden they're prepared to bear. Uh, it's still early in the Japanese debate. I mean, Japan didn't have a national security debate uh, for a long time. And what I think has come <clears throat> to the fore, I think it didn't begin with Prime Minister Abe, but it's reached a different level is that now these issues are being discussed quite publicly in Japan. What 10 or 20 years ago was almost unmentionable has now become pretty common about Japan's role, about expressions of uh, its defense posture beyond narrow concepts of self-defense, constitutional uh, revision, Japan pressing the United States at times to be a, a little bit more present and muscular. Uh, you don't have a consensus in Japan in the public on these things. So this will this will take time, but it's not as though Japan is still yet doing that much. Uh, you know, when we in this country have had tremendous disconnects, we were trying to remake countries that resisted being remade. And we had hundreds of thousands of troops uh, over uh, around the world. This is This is not even remotely akin to that. This is far far more modest. Now, historians 50 years from now may look back on it and say this was a, these were early data points on a certain trajectory. But I think what Japan is doing and what it's contemplating is still uh, extraordinarily modest uh, by, uh, by our standards. Is, is Japan's stepping up and stepping back out an unvarnished good for the United States, would you say? Uh, all things being equal, it is good. Uh, for several reasons, and I'll come to the caveats in a second. But I think it's good. Uh, the United States needs partners in general. Uh, the fact that Japan is willing to take on a slightly larger role, more commensurate with its uh, capacities, economic and military, I think is good. Uh, you know, a, a significant source of friction over the last few decades, in addition to the economic competition, uh, has been the sense that Japan didn't quite carry its weight. So the idea that Japan might be willing to do more around the world, or might be in particular willing to do a little bit more in this uh, region, whether it's vis-a-vis -vis China, and something we haven't talked about today, really, uh, North Korea, mm -hmm. uh, I think is, uh, is healthy. Uh, the area uh, where it potentially gets a little bit complicated for the United States and for Japan <clears throat> is it's essential, though, that if Japan does more, that the United States and Japan stay really close. We don't want to have situations where Japan's behavior perhaps gets triggers something with China, and the United States and Japan are not exactly on the same page. So for the United States, I actually think it's a uh, it's a very difficult foreign policy challenge. It's not one we will ever solve, but it's one we will constantly have to work, is that we need to welcome Japan to do more, mm -hmm. both to have more capacity and to use that capacity to, to be more present in the region. We need to be supportive of Japan, as we properly have been. On the other hand, we also have to be mindful, and Japan has to be mindful too. With that American support comes obligation on the part of Japan 
to also act in fashion in a, in a fashion that is responsible because we don't want to get into situations where we have uh, crises that are unwarranted that we with that essentially not, that to put it bluntly that that some Japanese uh, aircraft or, or naval vessel would do things that it ought not to uh, do so for the United States to be uh, supportive of Japan but it, there's, there's got to be somewhere there's a difference between conditionally and unconditionally supportive and I think that's the area where the United States and Japan have to have uh, regularly close conversations about what uh, what it is they are trying to bring about and what it is they are trying to avoid in, in this part of the world. Uh, Yoichi Bun, where does a robust Japan and its uh, projection of influence and power and, and economic might where does it necessarily lead in regards to China and the relationship bilaterally and in terms of the U.S. and, and global alliances? Uh, first of all, a robust Japan's posture, particularly military posture, uh, actually will remain to be very much limited um, for various reasons. Uh, one is that uh, I think the fiscal constraint, budget constraint, uh, as uh, Japanese population is aging uh, precipitously, so rapidly, uh, I don't think that Japan will be able to uh, increase that uh, defense budget, perhaps uh, uh, not uh, significantly. Um, it's still under 1% of total GDP, okay? even though Abe government has been in power for three years. Uh, it has not changed. Uh, second, I think that even though Abe administrations uh, passed uh, the uh, uh, security legislation bills, and uh, in which they uh, Japan is now allowed to exert that collective self-defense, okay, and that's actually uh, is long overdue in my view. It has uh, perhaps uh, it will contribute to at least create more mutuality uh, between the allies in terms of responsibility and obligation. Okay? But nonetheless, I think that it has been very much uh, tied, tied up to uh, the limitations, okay? uh, three conditions being imposed. And so it's basically incremental, uh, and also it still remains to be a, a, a defensive. Okay? The primary uh, uh, Japan being tasked with real uh, uh, support for Japan's ally, the United States, in any operation. Okay. So I do not think that uh, Japan's robust posture uh, will be uh, revolutionary. Uh, I think it's uh, evolutionary. I think it's uh, in the right direction. And I think that perhaps is very much important in that it can also uh, help Japan and the United States strengthen the deterrence vis-a-vis -vis particularly with China. Okay. Mm -hmm. If Japan will uh, too much rapidly uh, visibly uh, acquire that robust military posturing uh, or capability. I think that could not be uh, conducive to strengthening that uh, deterrence. Okay? Japan being a s somewhat uh, uh, weak, uh, vulnerable uh, and Japan being tied to the alliance itself, I think would be a part of assuring effect uh, to China. I think, think for Chikase, one thing, I think for Japan, the needle it has to thread, and it's a challenging one, is to do more so the United States feels it has a real partner. We don't want to have, for example, a version of the old burden sharing debate uh, come out about the United States and Japan, yeah. uh, which is why in part also the whole Okinawa issue and all that you know, it is a sensitive issue. On the other hand, Japan doesn't want to do things that are unsettling to the region. And how it, how it balances that, I think, for the Japanese will become a, uh, you know, that's, 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 that's a good example where diplomacy and statecraft, more than actually diplomacy, statecraft really comes into, comes into play. And <clears throat> as was brought out this morning, I mean, the economic influence of China's rise vis-a-vis -vis Japan, by far Japan's largest, largest trading partner, uh, that's going to only increase, one expects, uh, despite mm -hmm. the slowdown in China over time. Uh, Yoichi, isn't this going to naturally draw Japan in terms of seeking this renewed economic strength toward China, despite the uh, alliances uh, that you were just referring to? 
Well, Japan trade with China is about uh, 370 billion dollars, um, and the U.S.-Japan trade is about 190 billion. So soon, I think the U.S.-Japan-China uh, uh, trade will be twice as big as Japan trade with the United States. So naturally, inevitably, uh, Japan uh, will have much larger stake uh, in China, even in the, in the, by, you know, than in the United States. So we have to very, uh, 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 take care of tending to that equities and uh, interests uh, in China as elsewhere, uh, the other countries do. But at the same time, you know, I think Japan, it, it has been actually a really rude awakening. It was a rude awakening to Japan when uh, they, uh, 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 Japan uh, was uh, exposed to China's uh, economic pressure. Uh, in 2010, uh, when China uh, banned a rare earth to Japan in retaliation mm -hmm. uh, of uh, Japan, uh, Japanese authority detaining a Chinese boat captain, captain um, it's over Senkaku mm -hmm. uh, issues. Um, I still remember uh, uh, People's Daily's long commentary, um, actually a couple of uh, days after China decided to ban uh, the uh, rare earth to Japan export. It, say, it said that um, Japan now is lack of immunity to China's economic pressure. Okay. Um, and at, later, you know, a Jap Japanese government uh, uh, brought this case into the WTO. China lost, okay, uh, because it's so glaring violation of uh, gut rules. But, um, but this revealed uh, 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 real China, um, mercantilistic China. Um, if China uh, uh, regards the uh, economic interdependence as a sort of manifestation of other trading partners' weakness, vulnerability, then it would be extremely difficult for uh, the politi political leaders in the other countries uh, to pursue uh, engagement policy toward China. Okay? Uh, contra in stark contrast to Japan-South Korea relationship, which was based on peace, uh, uh, democratic peace concept. Uh, we, we cannot apply that democratic peace concept to Japan-China, because China is not a democracy. So instead, we actually uh, have resorted to uh, interdependence peace uh, strategy, okay? the uh, more, influent, uh, more modern, more affluent, more open China uh, will be that in the best interest for Japan as well as the region. Okay? So that should be the uh, strategic objective. That principle has been, uh, I think, a main, main pillar of the Japan foreign policy toward China since early 1970s. When Japan and China normalized the relationship. But then we were shocked to see that China, at a very critical juncture, uh, resorted to that economic uh, ban of rare earth in retaliation. Mm. So this uh, uh, is not lost uh, in Japan. I think that since then, I think Japanese business have tried to transfer the investment from China to elsewhere, particularly India and uh, Indonesia and uh, Southeast Asian countries, I think it would not stop. So South Korea just entered the discussion, I believe, for the first time today. Richard, you had mentioned North Korea and its strategic uh, uh, presence in this whole uh, discussion in the region. Talk, talk about Korea and it, the potentially combined Korea uh, and what, what role this might play in the future U.S., Japan, China triangulation. I'm much more worried about it when, while it's still a separated Korea. Mm -hmm. and, and it actually feeds on what Yuichi just said. I think it's important that in the Japanese-China relationship, and effectively the U.S.-Japanese-China triangle, and in the Japanese-North Korea, South Korea, U.S. quadrilateral, if you will, that again, the U.S. and Japan stay on the same page. With China, we have to avoid a situation where Japan grows so organically close economically with China that that in some way constrains Japanese freedom of maneuver strategically. Mm -hmm. 
And we don't want to get in a situation, we were talking about this before, akin to what was often the case across the Atlantic between the United States and the NATO allies, where their ties to the Soviet Union became a source of friction between the United States and Europe. It's just something we have to constantly work with Japan. In the case of North Korea, we don't want to get in a situation where, for example, Japan is so focused, as it is, on the abductee issue, which is so emotional, that they lose strategic perspective. Uh, it hasn't come up in the debates, but I think it's a, not a lot has come up in the debates this year, <laughs> but one of the things that has not come up in our debates is it's quite possible that during the first term of who's ever elected in 2016 here, that he or she will face the challenge of a North Korea that can put small nuclear warheads or smaller nuclear warheads on missiles that can reach the west coast of the United States. Is that a situation we are prepared to live with? Well, the United States and Japan had better talk about this. And Japan cannot approach then the problem. It doesn't happen then, by the way. It'll happen during the, you know, the next term of who's ever president. But Japan and the United States have to have this conversation. And they've got to coordinate what they would do about sanctions and so forth, and what, kind of, what conditions under which they might use military force, what would be war termination goals. The United States and Japan need to have a, strategic, a serious strategic dialogue about uh, North Korea. I actually think it's premature to have the conversation about how we would manage a unified Korea, except for one thing. I think the United States, Japan, and the Republic of Korea need to have a serious conversation about what would be the characteristics in the strategic sense of a unified Korea. About, for example, not having any nuclear capacity, about what if any foreign presence, pres military presence, if so where, what kind of forces, and so forth. Uh, what would be the strategic orientation? Because that's something that the three of us, the United States, Japan, and South Korea, should be communicating to Beijing. Because one of our goals ought to be, I believe, to influence what has been to me far too unconditional Chinese support for North Korea. But again, we can only do that if Seoul, Tokyo, and Washington are very much coordinated in the messages they, 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 they send to uh, China. But that means Japan needs to have a broader approach to North Korea and not one dominated so much by the abductee issue. Uh, we're going to go to the audience in a moment for uh, uh, spirited, I hope, Q&A. But let me, if I can pivot, to use that word, just ah. back to economics <laughs> for a moment. <clears throat> uh, the very good discussion this morning uh, raised various aspects of the effort to essentially revive the Japanese economy, uh, expansionary policies for the most part. I thought that could be extended a bit by asking about the currency value. This is, uh, can be a dry subject, but it also is very material to business interests and strategic interests in the region. Uh, Yoichi, is there a, a sort of uh, bottom line or baseline of how far back the yen can go uh, as part of this expansionary uh, effort? Uh, Dr. Alan Sinai at the Japan Society was using the 130 to 135 range yesterday as a short run uh, 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 likelihood. Uh, it's about 120 now, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, is there, as Japan, to use my robust term again, as it grows more robust, is there some limit as to how much weakening of the yen is tolerable? I don't have any <coughs> uh, any good crystal ball on the exchange rate level, but um, I think uh, Governor Kuroda uh, is very careful not to uh, depreciate yen uh, precipitously at this point. Yen is 121 around that, right? Um, I think that that's one of the reasons why he has been very careful. Well, actually, he has not been too much uh, inclined to uh, mobilize the, another bazooka, a QE. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, I think this current level is uh, acceptable to the United States and perhaps to the other uh, trading partners. But if it would uh, say should be, uh, should go uh, up to 135, 40, I think that inevitably, I think this will 
emerge as a serious uh, uh, political issues. Uh, and then we just have uh, concluded the TPP. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then Japan, Japanese yen being depreciated 135, 40. Okay? It would not be helpful that <laughs> Congress you, know, you, have a, you have a future in diplomacy. <laughs> you can I say, I mean, that's why we all have such a stake in the third arrow, not just Japan, because all around the world, in this country and virtually every European country, but also Japan, there's been an over-reliance on monetary policy. We're often unable to do things fiscally for political purposes, and reform is the hardest for everybody to do, whether it's Americans, Europeans, or Japanese. So we constantly then put too much emphasis on what central bankers do. But so if the central bank, essentially in Japan, Mr. Kuroda, has to bear the, the, the full burden yeah. of Japanese economic uh, growth, that's going to force him to do quantitative uh, and qualitative easing, as he would put it, uh, on steroids. Mm -hmm. The result will be to weaken the currency, to have it will have a big impact on the trade and, and protect, it's not just, it's TPP. But as we see again in the debates on both sides, by the way, this is bipartisan. People want bipartisanship. You've got it here. In both parties in the United States right now, there are powerful protectionist tendencies. Yeah. And this would, be, this would be just the ammunition they would need. So I, again, it's not just Japan, but the United States, I think, has a real stake uh, in, in, in the reformist dimension of Mr. Abe's uh, agenda. Yeah. Yes, last night we heard uh, Mr. Trump make reference to Japan taking jobs from America. We haven't heard that one for a while, so. Yeah, we had a conversation one morning, he and I on Morning Joe, and he said that Japan uh, was killing us. And I, I pointed out that roughly it's a two to one ratio of Japanese exports uh, to uh, U.S. exports to, uh, to Japan. And, but. I, and we, we kind of went back and forth on it, but I, I was surprised. I hadn't heard that kind of language for 25 years, and I, I pointed out that the Japanese economy wasn't exactly killing anyone except Japan uh, for most of the last 25 years. But it was, again, it, to me it was a signal of what's, it's what, yeah, in some cases the reality doesn't matter, whether it's this debate or the immigration debate. It's what people feel or think yeah. they know, and it's just, it's latent. I, I really think this is latent in the American body politic. Mm. So the inside word is no more bazooka shot tomorrow from Kuroda. Okay, we'll see. You can uh, hedge, your, hedge your bets on that. Well, um, <laughs> interventions, questions, comments from the middle front there? Mr. Siegel. Mr. Siegel. Hi, I'm Lee Siegel. Yoichi, yeah. this question yeah. is for you. Yeah. Uh, you. You talked about nationalism, and I want to ask you two questions about it, uh, rising nationalism in Japan. One is, What's the implication for dealing with South Korea if you have rising nationalism in Japan? Second question is, rising nationalism on the right and the left, not in the center where Abe is, isn't that anti-U.S. nationalism? On uh, the first question, I think unfortunately uh, we are seeing that nationalism in both countries, Japan and South Korea, are uh, being sort of uh, empowered, uh, emboldened, and uh, feeding each other. Um, and that will put constraint on the political leaders, maneuverability, uh, room to maneuver. Uh, and that's the major reason why we really got stuck that a much better relationship between Tokyo and Seoul. Um, I don't know how we really can extricate ourselves from this uh, situation. Um, the best scenario would be somehow miraculously Abe and Pakune, when they will meet, uh, will come up with some final solution, closure on the comfort women issue. But it's highly unlikely. Okay. I don't think the Japanese uh, government uh, is now prepared for that final uh, uh, that uh, to some compromise in return for final solution and vice versa. Um, I think that perhaps we should uh, uh, strengthen that military uh, to military uh, cooperation, if not coordination, uh, security dialogue. And that, as uh, Richard mentioned, that perhaps we really should uh, 
uh, try to come up with contingency planning in uh, case of the instability scenario of North Korea. Uh, and that, uh, you know, judging from my conversation with that Minister of Defense and Korean military top uh, high-ranking officers and officials, they're actually quite, quite uh, uh, in, uh, interested in strengthening this dialogue. Uh, but they actually have been very much uh, constrained by the Blue House political uh, politicals. Uh, second question, very, very intriguing question. Uh, you are completely right in saying that, that Japan's nationalism always has been a very much a latent uh, in both uh, uh, specters uh, of uh, right or uh, left. Okay? Uh, for instance, in 1960, when we had that huge anti-American demonstrations uh, on uh, the uh, rev revision of uh, uh, U.S.-Japan security treaty, uh, Abe's grandfather, Kishi, at that time was a prime minister. Okay? Um, basically, it was a sort of uh, a nationalism on the left side, even though they uh, focused on peace. Um, Japan actually you know, had uh, uh, you know, uh, become to be independent only uh, eight years before. Uh, so that uh, anti-occupation sentiment still very run high. Um, now I think uh, the uh, it's not that strong anti-American sentiment uh, in the um, nationalism in Japan. It's more anti-China uh, to a lesser extent anti-Korea. Okay. Uh, up to uh, 1989, Tiananmen incident, about 55 to 60 percent of Japanese had a favorable view of China. Okay. And that was a watershed moment. And then it has really, uh, that support level, favorable view has decreased. Now only, uh, I th now I think more than 90 some percent of the Japanese has an unfavorable view of China. Okay. This is actually, it's not a you know, national event itself, but this is really laid, I think, a foundation for that a nationalistic sentiment. So I think it's the core of the nationalistic sentiment. It's anti-China, fear of China, uh, is that, I think, the base of that nationalism, not anti-American in mind. Interesting. Question over here, please. Uh, and a reminder that we are on the record today, so please uh, identify yourself. Masazumi Nakayama, Citigroup. Um, if the income gap in Japan is widening, to Mr. Nabashi, the question to you. And if the income gap is widening in Japan, will it be an impact to the Japanese sentiment to the United States? Um, I don't think so. I think uh, income uh, gap has widened to some extent in Japan uh, in the past uh, uh, decade or so. But still, I think Japan's income gap is not as uh, glaringly uh, uh, huge as the other countries, such as the United States or China or elsewhere. Um, but having said that, certainly that has become to be a political issue these days, as you, uh, you, as you said. Uh, and some people certainly have uh, tried to uh, uh, explain that as Japan becoming to be more uh, Americanized. Uh, Japanese bankers uh, mimicking Wall Street investor ba banks, okay? And uh, uh, Japanese entrepreneurs, upstarts, uh, emulating that uh, Silicon Valley uh, entrepreneurs, and that's uh, the reason why we have, you know, uh, resulted in widening the income gap. But I think that but the income gap in Japan is most, uh, I think, uh, visibly uh, pronounced uh, in the uh, elderly uh, sector segment. Okay, uh, that the income gap is the widest uh, above that uh, generation 
60 years old. Okay? I don't think it has anything to do with America, actually. Okay? So I think uh, it's a political uh, argument, and I don't think there is much uh, geometry truth to that. Question over here. Marshall, sorry. <laughs> Upside down. <laughs> Marshall Bhutan, Asia Society of Policy Institute. Um, I'd like to bring you back to the, uh, the East China Sea, South China Sea. Um, there, were, I think it was Professor Takashi this morning talked about the, uh, the goal at this point should be the ritualization uh, of the way Japan and China, China and the US operate uh, around uh, those features in the middle of the sea. Um, and I, I, I really have to question that if I look back at how old, how much, how much surprise there was here and elsewhere when China started building those islands. Um, that it was a much more assertive, aggressive step that China took. And I'm not sure that one guided missile destroyer moving through the 12 mile zone uh, is going to dissuade China from that kind of position. And I'm worried that Ritualization as a status quo is going to be very difficult to maintain over time. I'd love to hear your thinking about where we should be trying to go, how we create a uh, more stable situation for the longer term. Richard, you want to start on that? Well, first of all, the island project, shall we say, is not uh, sui generis. You also had the unilateral declaration of the, the air defense identification zone. So you've now had multiple uh, examples of uh, what you might call unilateral assertiveness on the part of, uh, of China. And what we did qu more quickly with the air zone, but in both, is we, we demonstrated our uh, willingness and ability to essentially ignore it. And I think that's the sort of thing that ought to be done with whatever uh, frequency. I do think, though, it, it suggests the need more broadly to still flesh out the security, quote unquote, system that is the Asia Pacific. Again, a lot of my background was with the Europe, but it's hard not to be struck by the gap between the degree of uh, elaboration and formality of European security structures and those of the Asia Pacific. And you don't have the confidence building measures, you don't have uh, either in terms of uh, preventive mechanisms, you don't have the communications mechanisms in place, and you certainly don't have formal architecture in place about obligations. And so I, I just think that's something that ought to be on the agenda. So yeah, you can deal with the China Island issue as a kind of narrow one-off. But my, my, my view is that it's, it's part of a larger pattern of quote unquote Chinese strategic assertiveness. Well, that suggests to me that there's gonna be something else then next year and something else the year after that. And so it's not good enough or not adequate. It's necessary but not sufficient to deal with this with, with, with tactical responses. I think you need a larger conversation about what is, uh, what's the nature of strategic order in this part of the world and then countries like the United States, Japan, South Korea, and others, particularly those we have alliance relations with, have to decide what, uh, what it is we're going to do either formally together or in parallel in order to maintain that order or to bring about the order we, uh, we want. So I think, again, it's, it's fine that we do these ritualized, whatever the word is, uh, flights or, or sailings, but I would think that's, at the end of the day, that's not enough. Are, are the other parties in the region, India mentioned, Australia, um, potentially Southeast Asian powers, uh, such as they are, uh, are they meaningful to this strategic equation other than as symbolic uh, sort of uh, stopping, stopping points in the, in the uh, circle, as you will? Uh, I think so, yes. Now, it may not be as part of a formal Asia-Pacific architecture, but I think India is particularly important. I think, it, and again, I'm not talking about a U.S.-Indian anti-Chinese alliance. The Indians would want no part of it. Uh, we shouldn't want that either. 
but a strong India and a robust U.S.-Indian relationship, I think, is simply a strategic factor that a China needs to take into account. And that's what it is. What we want, the whole purpose ought to be that the Chinese should not uh, either embark on courses of action or come to define success that are, we would come to view that would be uh, detrimental or unacceptable for our interests. And, what, and the ways we bring that about may in some cases be formal alliances. In other cases, it may be through security targets. In other cases, it may simply be with strong relationships. Uh, so a Vietnam does what it does, and an India does what it does, and China simply has to take that into account. I, I never want a Chinese leader to come into office to think that China can do certain things and that uh, the risks are worth running because the benefits would outweigh the risks and the costs. I never want that calculation to enter into so instead, Now, we've got to be careful that we don't overload it the other way. And we want to avoid situations where it looks like it's a kind of uh, self-initiated containment of China. We don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. We want to make clear that China does have a place in the regional order, both in defining it and in maintaining it. It's the reason that the Asia Infrastructure Bank initiative on our part was so seriously misguided. Uh, but this is, this is the long-term conversation with China, which is as China gets stronger, as it emerges and plays a larger role beyond its borders, what, are, what, is, what is the definition of order? What, what, what's appropriate, what's acceptable, and what's not? And that's, a ser that's not a negotiation. That is a long-term consultation that we have with China, but we're much better off if we also have it from the, the context of a close U.S., Japanese, Korean, Indian set of uh, relations. But that, that's, the serious, that's the serious diplomatic challenge for the next couple of decades, I would think, in, um, in this part of the world. Question back, please. Hi, I'm journalist with China Central Television. Um, China just abandoned its one-child policy today after 35 years of restriction uh, when um, most Chinese families are restricted to have one, more than one child um, because the Chinese government has the fear that um, the aging population cannot provide adequate um, labor supply. So could you help, uh, could you, um, how do you evaluate the effectiveness of this policy to help stimu stimulate the Chinese economy? Do you think it's effective? Thank you. Uh, policy of rising fertility again. Uh. Well, do you want to, I, can, I can say one or two things. Uh, first of all, any effect it's going to have is going to be extremely delayed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> See, not just, anyone, not just anyone can become president of the Council on Foreign Relations. It takes really deep insights uh, like that. Secondly, uh, I have to do this in a PG sort of way here. Uh, just because people have this option, and lots of other societies where you can have whatever number of children you want, people don't avail themselves of it because of situations like the cost of education, the, the costs or limits to housing and jobs and so forth. So simply to change the policy doesn't mean that Chinese families are going to start rushing out and having babies. Uh, so many people, for example, in South Korea only have one child because the feeling is we've got to husband all of the family's resources to make sure that one child can compete in the educational system. So there's a, a self-imposed, if you will, one-child policy or limited child policy in certain countries. So China can change the policy in terms of de declaration. But my hunch is people in China will only have larger families when they feel that that's a sustainable uh, future. And that has everything to do with education, with housing, with jobs. Also, you have to, they're going to have to care for elderly people. So whatever the political impact in the short run of this change, I actually think much bigger things will have to change in, in China before this actually has a demographic uh, and economic impact. Yoichi, on the Japanese front on this regard, with the, as ever, finely engineered society developing a, a, a sort of army of robotics to look, look after its aging uh, population. Is there any real prospect that uh, we're going to see a bump up uh, again in Japanese fertility? Well, 
it takes a long time, as uh, Richard mentioned, uh, <laughs> even though... And the future lies ahead. No, uh, let's not forget. You don't have to defer to me on that issue. Uh, <laughs> but I'm most in intrigued uh, with uh, a possibility of this uh, rapidly aging and the decreasing population and its implication for that uh, military robustness uh, for uh, the society and nation. Um, I actually have a sense that uh, one of the major reasons why uh, the anti security legislation was so strong uh, in the past summer in Japan uh, was perhaps due to the uh, aging society. Um, only 18% of the Japanese uh, population above 65 years old supported that bill, okay. even though in January 30 to 36% uh, supported the bills. Okay. So it's lopsidedly uh, very much, they're lopsidedly uh, against the elderly, the, uh, uh, the bills. Okay. That may be perhaps uh, some symptom of pointing to that uh, the rapidly aging society, Japan society, uh, is not too much interested in strengthening that uh, robust military uh, capability uh, for various reasons. In Japan, of course, you know, that those uh, elderly have regarded that their history, uh, life, I should say, as a very much success story. And that in that narrative, that uh, Article 9 of the Peace Constitution is an essential part. They just do not want to change the status quo. They're very conservative. Okay? But perhaps more uh, uh, prosaic, uh, the, uh, prosaically, uh, they are very much afraid of uh, financial resources uh, transferred, uh, being transferred from caring and aging uh, into the uh, military budget. Okay? So very, very, uh, they are very much uh, alarmed with this prospect. I don't know how the Chinese situation will be. Okay? Perhaps uh, Xi Jinping's declaration to decrease that you know, army by 300,000, okay? Maybe a part of this uh, uh, you know, uh, demographic uh, uh, aspect, okay? Because it's more difficult for the army to recruit that, uh, you know, new soldiers. That actually has been happening in Japan in the past particularly 15 years. It's so acute now, okay? The police agency, fire department, and self-defense forces are competing fiercely uh, to recruit that uh, graduates of uh, senior high schools in Japan. That similar thing, I think, might happen in China too. Okay, so I don't know. Uh, maybe uh, I may be completely wrong here, but I'm very much intrigued intrigued with this aspect, of demographics and its military capability. Can I just make one point and then ask? Can I? I, I, I sure, really want to hear. Can. Thank you. I want to hear. I want to hear something from you, Ichi. But I want to make one point, which is one thing we haven't talked about a lot today is the U.S.-Japanese relationship can't just be bilateral. It can't just be regional. It really has to be global. And we have got to spend serious amounts of time talking about things like what kind of order for cyberspace, what is what, about climate change. This has got to be a a, a larger relationship. If this relationship is. Uh, going to have, I think, the, the significance and the role that it, that it needs to. Uh, but in the short, and there's going to be one issue, I'd love to hear your view. What happens if Congress does not support TPP? What is the, what is the implications on Japanese views of this relationship in the United States? What are the, uh, what are the repercussions? I think it would be devastating uh, to Japan and, uh, as well as America's partners uh, in Asia Pacific uh, if uh, a TPP uh, should fail. Uh, what does devastating um, mean? Uh, I think that uh, the rebalancing strategy, uh, I think, uh, will be will, uh, meet a huge setback. First of all, nobody will be serious about the U.S. Uh, rebalancing strategy any longer. So uh, that's one. 
Also, I think that China uh, will certainly uh, will become to be more assertive uh, in uh, pushing for their uh, uh, perimeter, uh, imposing that perhaps that the Monroe Doctrine kind of uh, sinocentric, a very hierarchical order vision uh, to Asia Pacific. And it would be almost unstoppable if uh, the TPP should fail. Korea, I think, uh, uh, would perhaps uh, gravitate even further into China orbit. But Korea is not a, a member of the TPP. Okay? There have been now emerged intense debates in, within Korea whether Korea should also sign up or not. Okay? And I think, I hope that Korea also should be a part. Uh, eventually, I think China should be a part. But I think that we will see more clear divide line between China camp and uh, the US-Japan camp or the US camp uh, in Asia Pacific. So I think that Ash Carter was right in saying that the TPP is a, you know, a really a aircraft carrier, megaton. Uh, 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 I think that uh, really would be the case. Uh, ASEAN could also uh, run risk of uh, being divided further. And I think it is imperative for us, particularly after this uh, uh, South China Sea uh, uh, detention uh, to maintain the unity of ASEAN. Uh, ASEAN's uh, integration and process of integration has been a major pillar of stabilizing effect in Asia Pacific, in addition to US-Japan alliance and Tong Xiaoping's peaceful rise strategy, okay, in my view. Okay. And now ASEAN is really now in a strain as uh, South China Sea issues has really become to be uh, a tense. So TPP actually really is a, a, a most strategic concept. We have seen the generation, in my view. So the fate of this uh, whole enterprise we've been discussing today really comes down to rest on the United States Congress. That's, uh, <laughs> that's an encouraging thought. <laughs> Well, uh, we have reached the, <laughs> the fateful end of our discussion today. Please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>